I guess that, that the, um, the way to describe geoengineering is to recognize from the beginning that it's a, it's a whole suite of technologies that can divide roughly into two parts. One part is uh, what's called uh, carbon capture and storage, or the methods that can be used to, uh, in theory, on a very large scale, uh, try to, to capture carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions and bury them in the ground, or bury them in geological formations or at the bottom of the ocean so that they're out of the air and they won't contribute to, uh, to temperature rise in the future. That's one set. Uh, the other set, aside from carbon capture and storage, is what's called solar radiation management. And these are strategies that would, in some way or another, control the thermostat of the planet by blocking or reflecting sunlight. And they range from re quite wild ideas like uh, putting up space mirrors somewhere between um, Earth and the sun that would block, again, and reflect back sunlight to the degree that was necessary, kind of a remote control system, which, of course, as you can imagine, would cost trillions of dollars and may or may not work, and, and uh, it's, it's a, a bit of a screwy idea at this stage. Uh, some of the other ideas for solar radiation management are, are more uh, simple, I suppose. Uh, they involve either uh, trying to increase the reflectivity of clouds over the ocean by blowing uh, salt water into the clouds which makes them more reflective and lowers temperatures. Uh, another strategy, which is the more common one when people talk about solar radiation management, is the idea that of, of uh, blowing sulfates into the stratosphere um, using large pipes or using fleets of aircraft that would, that would sort of coat the, uh, the, uh, the uh, stratosphere in a thin layer of dust, which would again just block enough sunlight so that, that um, the temperature would, would stop rising and freeze at a certain point. I mean, freeze in the sense of, of not increase at a certain point. So it's a range of massive initiatives that, that could uh, reduce greenhouse gases in the atmosphere or block, and or block the sunlight, basically. Um, it, it's, they've been talked about for a long time. I think they're, the ideas are really as old as the discussion over uh, climate change. So you can have conversations that go back to the 1960s and 1970s where this, these theories of this were, 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 were being proposed. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, we had a big push by a number of governments uh, looking at uh, carbon capture and storage through ocean fertilization. And that's again, is a, a proposal to uh, go to a, a nutrient deficit part of the ocean, uh, maybe iron deficit, for example, uh, an area like the, the uh, Humboldt Current off the coast of South America. And in that iron deficit region, simply dump um, um, nanoparticles or microparticles of iron into the surface of the ocean where uh, they can become a food source for phytoplankton. The phytoplankton could, could uh, increase um, rapidly from that food source, with absorbing carbon dioxide as they do. Uh, and then when the phytoplankton die, the bloom fades and they sink to the bottom of the ocean and they sequester the carbon dioxide uh, as they die. Uh, that's the theory. Uh, governments tried about a dozen different initiatives like this uh, in the 1990s and the early 2000s, up to 2008. Um, uh, and every time they tried it, it failed. Uh, they started off with very small uh, experiments of about 50 square kilometers of ocean where they would, they would uh, uh, use this, uh, this dump of iron in the ocean. That didn't work, so they went larger and larger, and they were, in the end, talking about 10,000 square kilometers of ocean at a time, uh, providing the, this dumping iron there and, and trying to block this, block or, or to, to get rid of carbon dioxide that way. Uh, the initiatives were, were amazing to us because they, they involved sometimes joint initiatives by the UK and Japan or the United States with Germany or South Africa with Germany, Canada was involved, Mexico was involved, Norway was involved in these experiments and yet none of them worked and each time they failed they wanted to go bigger and try again. Finally, and that's where we got into the, into the debates in uh, 2007, beginning of 2007, 
we started to say that these experiments were not only not working, but they were actually a threat to the oceans. They were just dumping things in the ocean that wasn't safe and wasn't good. And it was a false solution to climate change anyways. And the, we went to Bonn in 2008 to the meeting of the, of the UN Convention on, on Biological Diversity. And the UN Convention agreed with us that, that ocean fertilization shouldn't be allowed and adopted a moratorium against it. And the moratorium in, in, the, in the UN is a hard thing to get. It, it means that every single country at that time, I think, it was 192 countries that were members of the convention, all had to agree to the moratorium, and they did. So that, that pretty much shut it down. There was a move by the German government afterwards to try it, well, one part of the German government. There was actually a fight within the German government between different government departments, and they violated the moratorium, but afterwards they apologized for it and said they wouldn't do it again. And there were some private sector initiatives as well where private companies tried to make money out of ocean fertilization by selling carbon credits, by saying, okay, you, well, we're going to lower the temperature because we're going to do that. Uh, uh, you can emit more greenhouse gases yourself and your company. So, so you as, a, as, a, as Lufthansa or you as, as uh, BHP Billiton or, uh, or as Exxon, can emit more gases and, and we'll make up for that by, by this ocean fertilization experimentation. That, <coughs> excuse me, that clearly uh, wasn't on and that's been stopped as well. So it's, it's uh, I think that idea is, is dead, but the idea still of some way of car using carbon capture and storage lives on. And, and uh, we now find it's become much more sophisticated in a way, it's, it's now, uh, where companies and governments talk about bioenergy with carbon capture use and storage. So they're saying that we'll capture carbon out of the atmosphere or at source in a number of different ways. We can, we can capture carbon through creating new forests, and the forests will suck the carbon dioxide out of the air and they'll be stay in the trees, uh, or we'll, we'll, we'll capture carbon by using soil uh, strategies that will uh, suck more carbon into the soil and keep it in the soil, buried in the soil, so that it's safe there. Uh, and these, of course, are large-scale initiatives. They, they have to be uh, huge in order to actually have an impact on, on the temperature, on, on, on the amount of carbon dioxide we have. Some of the estimates suggest that we'd need one and a half Indias uh, in land area in order to have an influence over over the amount of carbon dioxide is, it's really causing damage to us with climate change. So, you know, it's, a, it's a, a bit of a wild idea that we've got that kind of land to use. And, and, and the danger, of course, with forests as well is that they move us pretty quickly towards sort of eucalyptus forests, monocultures of trees instead of diversity in forests. Uh, fast growing trees that, that will, can absorb carbon dioxide, and they do. But of course, the moment you cut the trees down, and if you use them as fuel, as firewood, and two and a half billion people still depend upon uh, firewood for, for their heating and for their cooking, then at that stage, the, the carbon is released. So you again, is back in the, in the environment again, and causing damage to, to uh, the, the temperatures. So it, of itself, again, it's not a solution. It, it's, it's a feel-good solution. It lets companies, again, sell carbon credits, but it doesn't, doesn't solve our problems. But it is geoengineering. And those strategies are there. It's, it's, um, it's sad that we've seen experiments in carbon capture going back again to at least the 1970s. I'm sure we could find some of those days much, much earlier than that. And those strategies have uniformly failed. We have really only one plant now on the planet that is functioning in any way that you could say is remotely effective. And that's in my country, uh, Canada, where we have um, uh, something called the Boundary Dam Power Plant. And the Boundary Dam Power Plant in Saskatchewan um, does take um, uh, gases from uh, uh, coal mines and from, from uh, the oil industry and does convert those gases, uh, uh, capture them, and then it pumps the gases. It doesn't, doesn't burn them or anything directly. It pumps the gases to oil, oil wells and uses them to, for what's called enhanced oil uh, uh, recovery, EOR, which means that in fact, yes, they are capturing carbon, at, carbon dioxide at source, but they're using it to actually 
pump it into wells to suck more carbon out of the ground again. Because, you know, when you have an oil well, initially it blows. It, it, uh, the pressure in the earth forces the oil up, and you simply capture it as it, as it flies through the pipes to, into the air. Uh, but at a certain stage, that doesn't happen anymore, and most of the oil is still down there, but it's not being pumped up. So if you can blast carbon dioxide into the well, you force up more oil. So instead of, in fact, trying to lower temperatures and making life easier for the planet, what that kind of enhanced strategy of, of carbon capture does is really use itself to, and that's the use part of, of, of BEX, uh, it, it, it actually lets it um, be used to, to, uh, to get more carbon out of the ground, to cause more damage to the planet. It's, it's the reverse of, of, of trying to help the planet. It's, uh, so the, the strategies to us are, are foolish. And the sad thing is in, in the negotiations around climate change is that governments uh, have bought into this. They've said we could have, um, was, again, it was called uh, GHG um, uh, uh, emission uh, controls. We, we, can, uh, we can step in and we will uh, neutralize our use, our greenhouse gas uses by, for, all, for every um, ton of, of uh, fossil fuel we pump out of the ground, we'll pump another ton of it back into the ground again. But again, mythical technologies, they don't exist. Um, they may never exist. Um, what we're really doing is we're giving the companies, the oil companies, the coal companies, and the nuclear power companies a new lease on life. Because uh, the nuclear power companies say, well, if you want to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, come to us. And again, the oil companies are saying, let us use these enhanced oil recovery strategies and other strategies to capture carbon dioxide. So pay us, subsidize us, to do our jobs, and, uh, and they won't. Uh, probably the, the clearest reason why we, we shouldn't trust these guys, why we shouldn't have any confidence in them, is because of Volkswagen. Uh, we had the experience in September of 2015 of Volkswagen admitting that they had intentionally created software that would fool governments and regulators and consume customers uh, to think that their emissions were, were actually better than they are. And they did that for years, got away with it, a deliberate effort to, to trick uh, regulators. Well, uh, what, where Volkswagen misbehaves, so does Exxon, so does Shell, so does British Petroleum. All of these companies, uh, I believe, cannot be trusted to, to, to really do carbon capture and storage in any kind of a safe way. I'm very distrustful of them. Uh, but that's just, now I've just been talking about one side of the, of the whole geoengineering equation. The other side is uh, related to what we again broadly call solar radiation management. And they, they go together because it, it's a two-part harmony in a way. It, it is that, that um, in the first instance, uh, governments are saying uh, in the COPs of the, of the climate change negotiations, they're saying that, that um, uh, they will, it's okay for, for governments not to, uh, uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions rapidly or extensively because of carbon capture and storage. But what happens when it doesn't work? What happens when we get to not 2015 but 2020 or 2030 or 2035 and it's clear that these, these mythical technologies aren't working, don't, don't, don't work or, or are too expensive? And some of the figures are just vastly expensive, $2 trillion of costs to, to store carbon dioxide in the earth um, and may not work. So when, they, so when that realization strikes and we realize that in fact the, the emissions are still going up, the fossil carbon companies have been still pumping out their oil and their coal, uh, where do we go? Well, then governments are stuck with really only one choice. By 2035 or so, if they haven't solved the problem, if they haven't really cut back their emissions the way they should, then they're left with solar radiation management. It's a kind of a, a quick fix for them. Where, and and they, they can say, well, we've been doing research in the background, and they are. We have the U.S. government, uh, the Chinese, the Russians, the Germans, the, U, uh, the U.K., are all doing research, at least in the labs, and some outside the labs, on strategies for solar radiation management. So they want to be in a position to be able to say, okay, we're stepping in here and we're going to 
on behalf of the planet, on behalf of everybody on the planet, we're going to cut back on the, on, on the amount of sunlight getting to the Earth by blowing sulfates into the stratosphere and, and blocking the sunlight. And I, I mean, I, whenever we talk about this, it, it sounds like we should have our, our brains tested. It sounds crazy, I know. Uh, but it's very realistic and it's very practical. And let me just describe why it's practical and why it scares us. Uh, it's practical because uh, we had the experience of Mount Pinatubo. In 1991, as we were really starting to talk about climate change, Mount Pinatubo erupted in the Philippines and it very quickly lowered temperatures around the world by anywhere from 0.7 degrees to I think in some places more than one and a half degrees. Uh, because all of the sulfates inside the mountain came up, they spread quite rapidly around the entire planet, some places more densely than other places, and temperatures fell. So it works. It's a technology that actually works. Can we create artificial volcanoes? Yes, we can. It's just a matter of hoisting pipes 20 or 30 kilometers into the uh, stratosphere, uh, which is not easy, but it's, it's, not, it's not impossible by any means. You can, you can put them up with uh, helium balloons, huge helium balloons holding them aloft, um, and you can uh, pump uh, sulfates through them, through the nozzles up into the stratosphere uh, to lower the temperatures. Uh, or you can have a fleet of aircraft again, just a, a handful of business jets uh, flying constantly around the equator uh, with sulfates being blown out the back door basically, uh, again lowering temperatures that way. Uh, the estimates are that the cost to do that could be as low as, initially, as low as about $700 million a year, but go up into a few billion dollars after a while. But again, even a few billion dollars in the context of climate change, to, to prevent climate change, um, is cheap by any standards. So it's, it's financially manageable for the planet to do solar radiation management. It's also technologically practical to do it. It's, it's, it can be achieved. We have the technologies already. It's not looking for a fictional technology that might be invented sometime down the road. So that that's, uh, stands in favor of doing it. It also can be done quickly. Probably from the time you start blowing sulfates into the stratosphere one way or another until you actually start to see temperatures dropping significantly it might only take a couple of years to lower temperatures by a couple of degrees. So it's, it seems eminently workable, uh, which then leaves you, of course, to say, so what's the downside of that? Why shouldn't we be doing that? And there's a lot of answers to that, and, and they, they should scare us. One of the answers is that once you start blowing sulfates into the stratosphere and artificially lowering the temperature, you can't stop easily. You've got to keep on doing it. So the sulfates go up. They'll stay aloft for anywhere from one to two years, depending on what you're actually using and they'll eventually drift back down again, which, by the way, is called acid rain. Not the best thing in the world. It acidifies the oceans and our forests and everything else as it comes down. It causes human health problems as well. But of course, to be fair, uh, climate change causes human health problems as well and causes other damages, so, so you can, it's, it's not unique in that sense. But in the case of solar radiation management, the, um, it, it's not just, once you start doing it again, if you ever stopped, if you ever 10 or 20 years down the road after doing it for that length of time decided that you didn't want to do it anymore or the government changed its policies or something intervened so it couldn't be done anymore or some side effect became known that made it too dangerous to continue to do, then stopping would instantly mean that you would have the temperature pop up to where it would have been if you hadn't done solar radiation management in the first place. So you go from maybe the temperature being kept artificially low for decades to suddenly bounce right up there with all the dangers that are involved in that, which would be really traumatic for, for agriculture, really traumatic for the planet. So it's a, it's a very dangerous thing if, if, if once you stop doing it. All you could do is try to wean the planet off of, of this strategy over a very long period of time to make it safe. And that, again, has other problems. The, um, another aspect of this that alarms us is, is that, and it's perhaps the most important one, is that who does it? Who makes the decision of how much solar radiation management is necessary, uh, where will it be done, and, um, and, uh, and who's going to control the thermostat, basically, for the planet? And that issue is a, is a tough one because the chances of the United Nations or the UN Convention on, uh, or Framework Convention on Climate Change 
coming together in 195 countries saying to each other, yes, let's do this and let's blow up so much sulfate to lower the temperature exactly this amount, one or two degrees, and let's do it uni uniformly around the entire globe. Chances of, of them agreeing on that are really close to zero. It's really Im almost impossible to think of how they, why they would agree to it because the impacts will not be uniform. The impacts will be different in different parts of the, of, of the planet. Uh, and so they won't agree to that. Which means then, I'll come back to that point, but, but what it really means then at the end of the day is that a so-called coalition of the willing has to come together and decide to do it on behalf of everybody else. So as we had with, with uh, the Cold War and nuclear, uh, extra stratospheric nuclear testing, we will also have with this hot war of climate change where, again, uh, a single government, the United States, for example, or a coalition of governments such as the United States, um, Russia, and China, which is very believable, frankly, would come together, and the three of them would say, well, on behalf of the rest of the planet, since you guys can't decide, we'll decide for you, we'll do it. And we'll do it over our own territory, so the UN isn't even involved in this. We'll do it blowing sulfates from our land base and in the temperate zone, and so the temperate zone will get the best effects of, of this solar radiation management. There'll be negative effects for sure as well, but they'll, by and large, uh, temperate zone countries would, with sulfates being blown in the temperate zone region, would do better than other regions. Where the damage will be done, though, and why it is that the United Nations would never agree to this, is that all the computer models show that you'd have severe damage over the northern part of South America, and severe, including part of the Amazon, severe damage over the sub-Sahelian Africa, especially that the border area, the Sahel border, border area with the Sahara Desert, and severe damage, uh, but, but more variable, I must admit, more variable over South Asia. Uh, you could see the, the monsoon in South Asia shifting below South Asia, which would mean drought and starvation, or not. We're not quite sure, depending on, on how it's done. And, this, and the variation, again, is true, equally true for Brazil or for, again, uh, Southern Africa. We're not quite sure how severe it would be. No one knows for sure. All we know is that the temperate or the tropical and subtropical parts of the world who have done the least to cause climate change would get the most damage by the solution of solar radiation management, by, by geoengineering. So it's unacceptable. Now, scientists are, who are in favor of geoengineering are arguing that um, they can manage this. That they can do enough experimentation, do more computer modeling over the next uh, decade or two, so that they will be able to give good advice to governments, so that, that uh, the amount of, of sulfates in the stratosphere doesn't have to be very great. It may just be that margin again between what governments themselves are doing to, to lower their emissions and what, what uh, uh, governments feel needs to be done to keep the temperature below two degrees, temperature rise by 2100. So they're saying, wait, we can adjust it. We can adjust it fairly finely, and we can look at what sorts of particles we use. Uh, some even talk about using nanoparticles of diamonds to, in the scar, in the, which is kind of mind-boggling, but they talk about it, as ways of, of, uh, of, of keeping the temperature lower. So they're saying, they can, don't worry, they will do the homework for us to make sure this is as scientifically sound as possible. And they admit that it still can be risky. Well, honestly, I think that is idiotic hubris when scientists think that they're going to play that kind of role. The moment that our politicians believe that they're, they're trapped by their mistakes in the past and they have no choice but to do solar radiation management, the moment they get to that decision, science goes out the window. Sound science will be ignored entirely and the scientists who want to do it the best way possible will be ignored as well. And it's, it's, it's pretty logical. Uh, we've had governments denying climate change for decades now. Same governments will, will, will be the ones who will be doing climate change with, with geoengineering. And they will have a range of advice that they'll be able to look at. They'll have scientists saying to them, well, the margin of error is between this and this. It'll be a, quite a wide margin of error. They'll be able to choose exactly where they want to put it, depending on the costs and the benefits they want to get. And they'll do it where they want to do it because they'll be given a range of places they could try it, whether it's China or the United States or the Soviet Union, Russia, pardon me. Uh, they'll be able to make their own decisions on that. And, and frankly, uh, scientists will be ignored. Or they'll just listen to the scientists they want to hear from, no one else. 
So those who are smugly and comfortably say, we're in on the ground floor on this, we're going to give the advice, it'll all be taken care of, they probably won't even be around when the decision is made. They won't even, they'll be long retired or long gone. And, and so those who are proposing these solutions won't be around to bear the burden of the effects of them. And I, and I think it's terribly dangerous. In the end, with all of these sort of geoengineering strategies, all that's really being done is we're giving a cl an opt-out clause to the polluting governments, the ones who've caused the damage in the first place, giving, giving them an excuse so they don't have to uh, do anything about greenhouse gas emissions themselves. They don't have to ch change their economies. It's an escape clause for them. And secondly, we're surrendering again the thermostat of the planet and the democracy uh, of science. We're surrendering that democracy to a handful of, com of countries and a handful of companies to make the decisions for the rest of the planet. And I don't know why the poor of the world should trust the rich of the world who caused the problem to solve the problem. Okay. The Accenture Group has been chasing technologies for almost four decades. And it's dawned on us some time ago that, that it, we shouldn't be ambulance chasing. We should be trying to get ahead of the, of the problem and creating an environment for technology assessment where not just governments even, but, but civil society, social movements can, can do their own technology assessments and give advice to the rest of society and advice to governments as to what they should be doing. Uh, so instead of going after nanotechnology for a few years and chasing after synthetic biology or geoengineering or genetically modified organisms uh, or robotics or big data, these kinds of issues, let's find a place where we, can, we the people, can, can look at these things uh, in advance of them arriving. <coughs> Excuse me. And can we, can we uh, make some assessment of these technologies? So we've been arguing with and, and talking with our allies uh, in social movements and saying, let's have regional technology assessment platforms, regional TAPs. And in these TAPs, uh, could we bring together uh, peasant organizations, scientific communities, uh, trade unions, um, uh, uh, poor people in the cities and the rural areas uh, to, to, to look at what's going on around them and to study the implications of these technologies and, and, and then express their concerns. We kind of need to have a, an early warning system by, by civil society. And in the case of, for example, Asia, you would have networks of, of social movements and, and NGOs coming together to say, well, what's happening now with synthetic biology? Uh, will it, how will it impact our exports of uh, some commodities in agriculture? Uh, will it have implications for biofuels? And is that good or bad? Uh, or what's happening with nanotechnology? Shouldn't we be looking at what it means for long-term trade patterns? Will it impact what raw materials are required, what mines need to be built or not built? Um, how do we respond to that? So we, we want to, we're anxious to establish those things on a regional basis so that a, a groups in Asia that work together, from trade unions and social movements and, and NGOs and scientists, can, can then go to ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, when they meet and say, hey folks, our early, our early warning to you is look out for nanotechnology or look out for geoengineering and here's the concerns that we've got before you uh, allow it into these countries. And ASEAN in turn then can make its own decisions about it or national governments in ASEAN can make their own national decisions about it all, but they can also take it to the United Nations. So each of the regions of the world has its own process of that where civil society is monitoring technologies if we have an early, that, they're, they're the early warning system. If the regional governments can be an early listening system, they can actually understand what's coming, apply their own understanding as well, of course, and then they can make their own decisions. But we also want to bring it beyond the regions to have inter-regional cooperation as well. We want to see the, uh, the groups that are working on nanotechnology in Asia talk to the groups who are working on nanotechnology in Europe and talk to the groups working on synthetic biology and how it impacts Africa, should be talking to the groups in Latin America and exchanging knowledge about what's happening, what's going to happen to different commodities. Oh, you're dealing with the same company. Let's understand what that company's strategy is. Who's got the intellectual property protection around this? How do we defend ourselves from those interests? 
and we now have a space as well through the real plus 20 process and the work being done in establishing the, the, the sustainable development goals for the years through to the years 2030. We have in New York as well the technology facilitation mechanism. We also have the technology bank that's been established. And these are two bodies at the UN now in New York which are committed to doing technology assessment as well as they're committed to doing uh, technology transfer. But they're saying before we transfer technology, we need to assess those technologies. And within those facilities in New York now, we have a space where civil society sits down in a multi-stakeholder forum with the scientific community and with industry. And we can debate these issues together in front of governments in an annual basis for, for some days each year in New York. Uh, and bring those to the level, to the attention of the high level panel or, or political panel in New York, which will be again at the ministerial level where governments will look at technologies as well. So we think we've got a, a trying to put together a system where from the grassroots groups in Asia, Africa, Latin America, Europe and North America, it's possible to have a, an assessment, feed that into regional governments and national governments and feed it into the United Nations as well. And to us that's just desperately needed. We haven't had that capacity in the UN of any capacity really in the UN to do technology assessment since the 1990s. It was all killed off in the 1990s. We need to get it back again. The world's spending, what, $1.6 trillion a year in scientific research and R&D. We've got seven million scientists working. Uh, we're developing technologies, uh, biotechnologies moving at what they say is five times the speed of Moore's law. Uh, we need to have a way of assessing those technologies. It's a sad situation that we've got people, good, decent people around the world who are alarmed by the emissions coming from the back end of, of jet aircraft, and they, they're often called chemtrailers. Uh, they see the pollution coming out of airplanes, uh, especially near airports, but in, on flight routes, and they know that, that in the, in the uh, emissions from, from, the, uh, from the jet planes, there are you know, toxic substances that, that come out of them. And, and they uh, are afraid that this is, going to, this is a form of geoengineering, as they perceive it, and they're afraid that it's, it's going to cause damage to crops, damage to the health and well-being of people. Sometimes they talk about causing sterilization of populations, trying to kill off people, and so on. At that level, it becomes quite crazy, frankly. It, it's, it's, uh, no one can deny that there aren't toxic substances coming out of the back end of airplanes. That's always obviously true. Um, we'd rather they didn't. <laughs> we'd rather it was clean. Uh, but is it, is it going to change the, the uh, atmosphere of the planet? Is it going to be a form of geoengineering? No, it's not, not remotely that. It's not even slightly that. Is it a strategy by governments to kill people or to sterilize people or sicken people? No, it's not. It's, it's, it's simply stupid industries doing stupid things sometimes, inadequately. Um, so I, I sympathize with, with their alarm. I share their distrust of industry, uh, but not to that degree. And, and I think that they're kind of way over the top and a little bit crazy when they start hallucinating about this being a, a plot to kill people. That's just nonsense.